Today, um, our speaker um, is our own uh, Walt Morgan, uh, who is uh, Mr. Astronomy uh, to many of us uh, here at Stone Ridge Creek. Um, Walt uh, is the owner of the uh, telescope housed in the astronomical dome uh, found at the north end of the SRC campus. I'm sure everybody has seen that. And uh, he is the main speaker uh, for the SRC Astronomy Club meetings, which, uh, uh, by the way, are held uh, in Legacy Theater at 1.30 p.m. on the fourth Friday of, of each month. As a member uh, of the technical staff at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Walt spent uh, most of his career working uh, on the fielding of underground nuclear tests at the nuclear test site uh, in uh, Nevada. Uh, he never uh, took a university course on astronomy, and he's very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Walt does have a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in uh, physics. So early on uh, in his career, uh, Walt became uh, involved uh, in the work of the International Occultation Timing Association, abbreviated uh, IOTA, also uh, the Greek letter IOTA. He and uh, his colleagues uh, worked uh, on the timing of the movement of asteroids. Uh, in this work, uh, uh, they, they proved that asteroids actually move in groups as opposed to individuals, and uh, apparently this was a surprising result at the time. Here at Stone Ridge Creek, Walt likes to help SRC residents learn about all things astronomical, and in particular helps residents define and observe astronomical bodies, as well as man-made orbiting objects. Today, he will give us a broad view of efforts and accomplishments of astronomers and various governmental astronomical projects. And uh, this is the, the title of his talk uh, that you see uh, in front of you. So, Walt, thanks very much for your willingness uh, to educate us on some very uh, exciting scientific efforts. Okay, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> um, there's uh, one comment to make. We, the Astronomy Club normally is fourth Friday every week, but I passed word out to someone on my email list this today counts as next Friday, so no meeting Friday eight days from now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm told, is, will be recorded, so uh, there you can watch us again to get your fix if you need. I'm pleased to announce that today I have two of my children are present here. Oh. <laughs> One of them, the son of Arne, is down from Olympia for the week. I did it. And my daughter lives in Fremont. She comes by more often in order to swear away the messed up checkbook and reboot the computer. And her husband's also here at the And I think both have taken astronomy courses, so they're better qualified than I am. <laughs> but I have more time in the telescope. <laughs> so, and of course, I broke iron into an opportunity of astronomy very early. When he was about 10 years old, there was this swore eclipse came along and it was going to be on a weekday school. So we, we took a little pocket mirror and made a bracket for it, put a piece of cardboard over the hole in it, and we had a reflective pinhole camera. So then, and we made a little stand so we could adjust the height of it. So he went to school and projected an image of the eclipse on the north wall of the school. and. <laughs> All the other classes come up and look at it. So, so he was the astronomer of the day. And my grade school recollection of Julie, a little different. One of her older brothers had uh, had me come to their 
fifth grade class to talk about something or other, I don't know what. And she was preparing to lend me a sign. So that day she says, can you come and talk to my class? And I said, gee, you know, I just don't think I can talk to third graders. <laughs> and so she seemed to accept that. But it was the spring of the year, and summer went by. She was in the fourth grade. She came home from school. What are you going to talk to my class? <laughs> <laughs> so we arranged something. <laughs> uh, but then we're on this uh, today. Um, the, uh, uh, the lecture committee organizes lectures. So this is supposed to be a lecture, but to me it's a presentation because lectures imply maybe grades, tests, written tests, oral tests, pop quizzes, none of that. You're off to put, no, and I do have a question. Well, why did I call this meeting? Oh, oh, yeah, pictures. We got different pictures, do it right. Okay, so here's a little summary of things and, and the description that Lynn gave you today's talk might come pretty close to what's up here. We'll find out. Um, okay, to find out what's up in space, we can look with our eye. We can use a telescope, and I break the telescope use into two different categories. One is imaging, where you see the space and brightness, spatial dimensions, so on. And the spectroscopy looks at different wavelengths of light and learns things from that. And then you can make telescopes, you better by <clears throat> making them larger. You can put them at higher elevations. Now the Mount Hamilton telescope, which has been there since the 1890s, is at about 4,000 feet elevation. And it was the first permanent observatory to be located at a higher elevation. But then Mount Palomar is at about 6,000 feet. Their telescope in Hawaii <coughs> and South America are 13 and 14,000 feet. But even at those elevations, there's still more than half the atmosphere above them. But it helps a lot, no doubt. Then, so the next thing that is brought into space, and then finally with the James Webb, we go into outer space. Uh, it's, the moon is about a quarter million miles away, and the James Webb telescope is about a million miles away. Okay, then, other things you can do is go and visit things. You can send a man, you can send a robot, you can make a flyby, you can go out and visit, hang around for a while somewhere, or you can make a frontal confrontation, I'll have an example of that later. So we start back before the optical age, in the era of long time ago. Here we have, we all recognize Stonehenge, um, Stonehenge, I, there were a great many monuments of this sort built at the time around the world, but I use Stonehenge as an example here because I've been there, I suspect many of you have been there. And the, a different view of it, you can see the, on the uh, top of this upright, Two stones are joined together, and it shows the detail of what they've done in the lower right. Mortise and tenon to pin the two ends, and then a tongue and groove to, to join them in the other direction. They put a lot of effort into that. Well, it turns out they were about 2,000 years building Stonehenge. They can trace the early days, the late days. It was slowly, slowly evolving. It was the Stone Age, and they moved at a glacial pace. Uh, many of the stones they've traced to from more than 100 miles away. Uh, and some skepticism whether they really moved them or whether it was, uh, you know, magical, something up there. But in 1995, they put together a crew of 100 people that took one of these 40 ton stones or a similar stone and put it on sort of a sleigh thing and managed to move it 15 miles. So it's possible with no, they don't have some like rope or some of that But to, with the primitive tools they had, yes, they could move these stones. They can trace where they came from. And this is what happened. Then of course, why did they put it there? Well, 
There's, there's lots of funerary evidence there. But more importantly, they mark some points on the compass. If you look at the compass, this, the sun rises in the east, sort of, but throughout the year it goes a little further north, a little further south. And the, the, the extreme point where it turns around in the spur surface is a specific angle. And similarly in the winter, at the sunrise azimuth, winter solstice in late December. So they had a stone lined up in sunrise azimuth for the summer solstice and the sunset azimuth for the winter solstice. The two of these four critical points that they used are marked by those stones. And it gives a, when you're in the right place at the right time of year, we get a specific view. And then I think it's interesting to be aware that in doing that, the basic tool they had was a, what I call a gun sight. They got a stick with a couple of points on it. You can line it up with sight. That's about the only tool it would have had. They can, they can sight on the sun at some point and figure an angle and mark it down. A year later, they can find it's the same and so on. <laughs> but nevertheless, just a gun sight, I think it's a pretty good description. Uh, if I needed a simple surveying tool like that, I'd take a stick, drive a couple of nails in the side across the heads, but they didn't have any nails. So some, but they could do something, lash a stick on or something. Okay, then that was the early part of the before optical. There was a big span, which is the middle part uh, before optical aids. During that time, uh, they really couldn't see any more than the Stone Age people could. Uh, so they, they had lots of chance to argue about why and what's going on. And geocentricism was the popular philosophy that says that everything moves around the earth. And so that was by those famous names there, uh, a great um, amount was written and discussed and trying to figure out what it's all about. But they had nothing to go on. Just their bare bones eyes, they had no tools any better than the stone yet, and people did. It really helps to have better equipment. So that era came to an end in 1600. And the last person who made a significant contribution to the before optical AIDS era was his fellow Heiko Rai. He lived in Denmark. He was of the nobility. This frame there by uh, the shields of his family get traced back several generations that all were uh, well known by the crown, and he was favored by the crown also. He, and in 1572, he saw a bright star that hadn't been there before. And this was the thing that really got him pointed down the line, interested in this sort of thing. The, all of this the smart money, the philosophers said that was impossible. The skies were unchanging, but he saw a star appear where there hadn't been one. It goes on. So his approach to look at that was to develop measuring devices to look where things are and really establish and see if it changes. And then the new star that we got from that, we got the word supernova. He, is, he established that it was further away from Earth than the moon was. <clears throat> so he received tremendous support from the king, including an island. The king let him have the island to create an observatory and a staff of 100. This would be quite an operation for uh, 1600. <clears throat> In his final year, he died when he was only 55. And that last, a year before he died, the stuff of Johannes Kepler showed up. He'd fallen out of favor in a nearby country and got sent over to Denmark to work with Kepler. And Alinda, that was a very fortunate thing. He, uh, uh, Tycho was the data taker, the gatherer, but Kepler was had a more analytical mind and could do something with it. So later, uh, after 
uh, Thaco died, Kepler had access to his data and was able to use that to study positions of things. And from that, he created his, he developed his three laws of planetary motion, which the important part is to establish that uh, the planets and other things are not really moving in circular orbits, but in elliptical orbits. That made all the difference in trying to, to match the, the calculated, the estimate of what's happening with what they're really observing. This is a picture of Tycho's uh, second observatory. It's underground. You're seeing the above ground part. He found things were so unstable above ground, he created a second story that went underground. That's uh, how ridiculous he was about things. This is some of his instruments. And you can see they're basically gun sites, just like stone hands must have used, but one difference. They're brass, they're not stone. He had was into, into an advanced era. He could use metal. This the the item on the right here was known as his grand quadrant. And again, it's just basically a gun sight. But notice over here, for example, in this one, you see a a uh, <clears throat> uh, weight there, button bob, allowing him to precisely line things on, on this one you see on the table he's got the little screws to adjust the elevation very precisely he has a scale around the top he can read off angles accurately uh, a circular a scale here to meet be angled on um, his cell uh, and quadrant on on the right this one it said that he could resolve angles to a hundredth of a degree, which, you know, with no optical aid, just the eyeball sighting down the guns. So his ability to have metals to work with <clears throat> and that sort of thing and made that possible. So he made some big advances, but in a sense, he was no further advanced than the Stone Age people. They had millennia to discuss it and everything, but still didn't really know how things went together. Okay, so that kind of big argument is everything centered around the Earth, which was the popular belief, or around the Sun. Well, this is a, a heliocentered model called an aura reading, and it very simple shows that on a common shaft, they could mount the eight planets around the Sun they could move them independently. They take Neptune off the right there. Here's the furthest one away, so it's lowest on the shaft, so we can turn it down without interfering with anything else. And Mercury, of course, is at the top. So, and there's considerable interest in being able to do this mechanically. Open the mechanical business would explain the mechanism that you could tell when were things going to happen and so on. But this is a simple model to just show what's coming up here next. This was the geocentric theory, one way of demonstrating it. It shows the Earth at the center, and then it shows a sphere for each of the planets and the sun, and of course the moon. And the sphere concept, I'm sure, what it came from, they knew that out beyond everything else was the sphere that had the stars on it. You look up, down, left, right, all around you, a total sphere, we're surrounded by stars. Which stars you saw in a time here, and this sort of thing. But if the stars were on spheres, then these other things must be too. And so if you put Venus on the sphere, it never covered very much of the sphere. It, a disc would have been a better representation because the angle of the plane was, it was almost always constant. Nevertheless, they knew the spheres had to apply to the stars, so they pretended everything else was on the sphere too. There's a better way of showing the same kind of thing or a different way, I'll say. You put the Earth at the center, and then you see you, you have the moon down at the bottom. They knew the moon went around the Earth. Everything did, and so the moon had to do. You go out a little way, you see the sun. It's also going around the Earth. That's nice and simple. And then at the outer edge, you see the sphere of stars. Now, everything else in there, 
as a planet, which is referred to at the time as traveling stars. You know, it didn't know that the planets uh, had any size to them, their points of light. They had no optical aid. We see Venus in the current in the evening sky, and very, very bright. But the donated eye is just a bright star. And so notice that with, with the planets, each one of them has a little supplemental circle in it. Well, can I give you an idea what happens is, as you see the planets go by and compare it to the position of a, a particular star or the sun, you'll find it isn't, doesn't have a continuous motion. Here's an example I found a really good illustration of a, which is showing what they call retrograde motion for a, an asteroid. Now, the, the story is that the asteroid is moving basically from the left to the right, but it doesn't move in a nice, smooth, uniform thing. It goes up and slows down, turns around, turns around again, and goes back. When it's going from the right to the left, that's called retrograde. Most of the time, it's progressing left to right, but part of the time, it's right to left. And the reason for that is because the asteroid and Earth are both moving in a somewhat circular fashion. So things don't all line up me. It doesn't mean that the asteroid was zinging back and forth. It had its own continuous motion, but the relative alignment produced this retrograde motion. And that's why they put these little circles in here called uh, epicycles. The one they show a little more detail on is one from Mars here marked in red. Mars is making a basic trip around counterclockwise but it's on an epicycle. So as it goes, it follows that little circle. The circle with red Mars on is moving around, and Mars is on a little circle. So you can see what happens is that it moves to the left. Mars itself comes down and crosses the center of its path, goes underneath it, appears to stop, turn around, and go up again. And so by introducing the concept of epicycles, they explain this retrograde motion they would find. So they were desperate, they sort of they worked hard, they find things to work. They didn't have to do it with the sun, the sun behaved very nicely. So it was consistent with moving around the earth just like the moon did. But uh, the, the traveling stars are up. Okay, now we get to the optical age. The day is 1610. There was a clear record when the telescope was first pointed at the sky, and any observation was made that had any quantitative assessment to it. Eyeglasses were not a new thing. They had been around several centuries, and so the learning to grind glass and do things optical with. And in particular, for our case, Elhans Lickershe in 1608 tried to patent a telescope and heard the outcome of that whether he actually got a patent or whatever. But Galileo heard about it and made his own. And then the big difference came about. He put it to use and thought about what he saw. So his first telescope was like an 8 to 10 power. Uh, our binoculars are set. And if you have a, your own, are probably in the range of 6 to 8 power. It means that something looks like it's six to eight times closer. So, Galileo soon made a second telescope, which was 20 power, and that's what he used for his first observations in uh, January of 1610. On the 10th of January, he pointed up and he saw Jupiter, and he saw Jupiter aligned with three stars, but very strange, but there they were, his notebook said, Nice straight line of three stars and close to Jupiter. And then he uh, uh, also looked at Saturn. He was observing all sorts of things. And he published a report on that. The first time anything is reported when connection was seen something through a telescope, just nine weeks after his first observation, it included an account of moon circling Jupiter he simply he realized and uh, said so he first that first night he saw the three stars lining up. The next time he looked, there were four. And so then he got looking within days, 
they figured out those are not stars, those are moons. They were going around Jupiter. You can, in a matter of two or three weeks, figure out what the orbital periods are for those. Uh, his account also uh, showed evidence of mountainous terrain on the moon. Well, this was heresy too. Everything out there was perfectly smooth and nice, but he had some magnification. He could see that the moon was not a smooth surface. He saw, he take a look at constellation, and he could see seven to ten times as many stars as they thought were in that constellation. All of this was rather revolutionary. He included 70 sketches in that first publication. Then a rather remarkable thing, uh, Kepler, meanwhile, had all this data from Tycho. He saw what Cal like a Galileo had reported, and he endorsed it. And in a few months, he started, he was able to get his own telescopes, do the same kind of experiments, and confirm what Galileo uh, had uh, reported. And this is, I believe, the first time, the first evidence of what we've come to call the, the new scientific method. You, you do an experiment, learn something, then somebody else has to repeat the experiment and get the same result where you disagree and you have to resolve things. Okay, so this is a photograph taken with a telescope very similar to mine and it shows Saturn and its four moons. Now the first, first time he did it, he saw only three. He didn't, let's say there are three in line now because of Kerberos. But the next night he saw four because they'd moved. The moons will go in front of Jupiter or behind Jupiter. They may pass above or below any of those possibilities, but sometimes you can't see all four because they're hidden by Jupiter. And so this is what he saw. And that's it, it's changing day by day. I quickly figured out there were moons and how long it took him to go around. The moon that is furthest from Jupiter only takes a month to go from the extreme right to the extreme left and back to the right. And the other three are all faster than that. So it's one of them is only a little weak and makes a slow road uh, um, change. Okay, a little sideline here. <clears throat> um, a fellow by the name of Marius, four years later, was claiming he was the first one to see those moons. And he had the notebooks with the dates to prove it, dated in December, you know, some weeks before Galileo's. But then Galileo didn't take too long. Yeah, yeah. there are different calendars. There was a little crossover time there. There was no uniform agreement as to whether the Gregorian calendar or the Julian was the correct one. They're using different ones. When you reconcile that, it turns out that the yes, Galileo was first. But the reason that Marius was bringing the point up was he wanted to claim the right to name those moons. Well, uh, Galileo had named the moons for the Medici, who were the people funding his observatory. The uh, one that pays you and that lets you uh, eat and and do all these experiments it deserves some credit. So he was naming for them, but somehow history gave the right to name those to Marius, and that's the name to use. Uh, oh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are the names that Marius had, and that's the ones we used. We forgot about the ones yeah, and as very little do with anything. Just a matter of prestige, a little professional swap went. Here is one of the sketches that uh, Galileo made at the, uh, the one left, left center. You see at the upper part there was, he, he sketched in a maria. He deduced that that was a flat area because the sunlight line was a straight line. We go above and below that, particularly you see it on the, on the right, and this one, you can see all the irregularities there at the start, which since the, it's clearly the shadow of the sun, where the edge is terminated, where the sun is shining and where it's not, that is revealing different elevation. The surface of the moon is not smooth. There were mountains, there were something. You knew that these dark areas 
where the line was straight, that had to be flatter and probably lower. Now with the uh, lower left, you can see a prominent crater in the lower part. He's throwing, showing the shadow on the left side of the crater and right edge on the right, clearly showing that that had depth. That had to be some elevation change, when, although, of course, what it was. But without the telescope, nobody could see that. So this is a kind of breakthrough that, that the Galileo was making. So he's, uh, Galileo is, is really put a big uh, uh, pitch in the question about the geocentric. But there are all sorts of evidence here that lots of things are not moving around here. And things are not smooth and uniform the way that everybody had soon. He figured out those orbital periods within a few weeks. And then another, maybe the most dramatic uh, evidence he produced in those early days was with the fact that Venus going through phases. On the right, the line is, assumes that, book, that Venus makes a loop between Earth and the Sun. Sun goes around out there and Venus in between. Okay, you take the sketch part number one up here at the right, that's the kind of crust that you'd expect to see. If that's the way things were, then you get to two and three, you're going to see the same kind of crescent, but they're smaller because Venus away. And then it repeats down on the left side. If on the left side here, you have the sun, uh, Venus going around the sun, and the Earth going around the sun, then at these location, now one, two, three, four, so that you see these. At position one, you see a large crescent, at position two, you see a, a half Venus. At the position three and four, you see a full Venus. <clears throat> it's fully illuminated as we see it from the Earth. And so on down, five and six. That was very, very powerful evidence for the left-hand diagram. That Venus and the Earth are both going around the sun. Then, uh, Galileo and Kepler, of course, were associates. Of, uh, they didn't live close together at all, but they communicated, obviously. And so Galileo announced this evidence of, about Venus phases to Kepler through an anagram. And it's given there. Uh, either Latin is better than mine, I'm sure. So I assume that those words, in the, that these are real Latin words, and they're not known. But the thing was, he sent the anagram, and without any further knowledge, Kepler had no way of knowing what it meant. But he had the message, and there it was, on the record. Later, and I suspect several months later, Galileo sent the unscrambled anagram, which is this one here. So this line and this line has the identical number of letters of each type. But being scrambled, this one is meaning. It translates to the fact that Venus emulates the figures of the moon. That means it goes through the phases like the moon does. And that's the diagram we're just looking at. So what was happening here was that it takes a, about a year and a half for Venus to make the full loop around from where we see it. Nine months it leads the sun, then there were nine months it trails the sun. I believe that Galileo had seen six or eight or ten months go by and saw what was happening, and he, he knew the answer, but he didn't have the proof until he saw it complete the full cycle of a year and a half. How do you know that you really have it pinned down? So I believe what happened, he's halfway along this, he knows of other phases of, of Venus, but he's, rather than just outright claim it, he put it in his coded form. So then Kepler had on the record, when, when he made the statement, he just didn't know what the statement was. So it's a question of, of protecting his intellectual property. Oh, then a few months later, he gave the unscrambled version of the anagram and made the claim that, that the Venus and the Moon both show phases very much alike, which is 
very, very critical to the whole idea of the heliocentric model. Okay, now, uh, I had said the second or one, one part of the optics of business of astronomy is spectroscopy. That's just understanding that light has lots of wavelengths and uh, then you put that to use somehow. The pioneer in that was Isaac Newton. He came along about 50 years after Galileo. Uh, he was obviously a very smart person, graduated from Cambridge, and the next year started doing experiments with prisms. He had been interested in trying to figure out the problems with lenses when they are pretty well known as it say, this is 50 and 70 years after Galileo. The lenses they're making are not giving the quality optics they want. And he was looking into that. Then he had the inspiration to investigate it with prism, which are very simple lenses, if you will, nice flat sides. And everybody knew that prism would break light into different colors. And, but he got systematic about how uh, he was doing this at home. He graduated from Cambridge the year before, but Cambridge was shut down. What do you know? There was a great plague on them. And so they closed the university for a while. But he had the money and the capability to experiment at home. So he punched a little small hole in the mine for the dark room and put light to a prison and looked to see what would happen. So now the, the convention we have is that that to the visible spectrum is divided into seven colors. And I learned them as V-I-B-G-Y-O-R, the first letters of, of the seven colors you see there. Those choices of colors were made by Newton. You can, well, go to any lipstick manufacturer and you'll find they can put those colors, they can name a, a hundred different variations of colors. But we are mature to think of them typically as seven. And it's believed that probably Newton chose to do seven because it seemed to have nice symmetry to the musical scale with seven notes. So whatever. One of the experiments he did was very important. Let light in through a slit, put through the prism, to get the various colors. Then at this point, put in another slit. So let only the yellow light go through. Put that through a prism, it still had yellow. Now they're telling you something. <coughs> move the slit down to the blue then, let it go through the prism, you only had blue. Okay, this is a war. You have to think about why that's happening. Why did it split up colors and then it doesn't split the colors anymore? So this is knowledge. Another experiment he did, which is more convincing, he put it through prism, got various colors, put another, put it through another prism, and got back his white light. Okay, I'll stop and think about what's going on. The whole light was a mystery to them, but he was the one who was piecing it together that it's a collection that light is consists of many, many wavelengths, and these are the, the kind of properties you can result. And once you understand that and put a mathematical basis, you can progress and put cues. So we have now, this is jumping ahead a few centuries up to modern times, the overall curve there is the spectrum of the sun, the shaded area from, from 360 to 830 nanometers is the visible spectrum, and, but the spectrum is very chopped up because there are various elements and things interfering, each of which tend to absorb some of the wavelengths. So it turns out that's very specific. You see the iron shows up here, and here, and here, and so when you see something that has those specific wavelengths in Albany, no iron is involved somehow. One that's really strong is sodium, that's a double. There are two wavelengths very close together in the yellow that are indicative of sodium. So it's understanding how these things interact. This is a fine detail, and what the people are able to start to grab hold of and use to interpret the data they were seeing beginning in the, some time after Newton. Newton, uh, to get away from the spectroscopy for the moment, he made a number of, of very important contributions. 
And this is a second one I'll identify by just showing the simple diagram of a refractor telescope. You have a basic lens here, which gathers light and brings it to a focus. Then you take a small lens, an eyepiece, and you can look at that, and you have a magnified image. And it's a brighter image because you collect the light over a good size area there. That's nice, simple, straightforward. That's exactly what Galileo had. He, he had another idea. The problem with this is, he, is that if the lens, if there's more than one wavelength involved here, the lens tends to transmit the different wavelengths through somewhat differently, and the image quality is not as nice as you'd like. So his solution was use a reflector. Instead of bend the light with a lens, bend it with a mirror. The mirror bends all wavelengths equally and solves the problem. And of course, what's going to happen is this mirror wants to bring it to focus up here. A little hard to look at that. You put your head out there and, and you've interfered to the light. If you put the eyepiece here, well, a little simple diagonal mirror bends it over here and you can look at it. The first telescope that I paid any money for was exactly like this Newtonian telescope. That's 300 years after Newton, uh, and is still the, the type of scope you get the most bang for the buck. You can see more uh, interesting things in the sky for a $100 scope, uh, Newtonian, and again for $100 of any other kind of telescope. And so it's very common. In fact, we have here the 200-inch scale telescope at Mount Palomar. You're looking in the front entrance. So that big ring is something over 200 inches in diameter. And down at the bottom there, you can see some reflection. That's the mirror, the 200 inch mirror. And so what's happening is they're operating a scope that we call prime focus. If I go back to this, it's equivalent to uh, getting rid of this diagonal. You have that cylinder in there form the image right there. It's very simple. You interfere with light by this, this pipe is, is blocking some of the light. So maybe out of your 200 inches, you only get an 80 or 85 percent of the light comes down to the mirror. But you get this simple optics and mirror thing instead of refractor. And so that works. Well, maybe you figured out by now something else interesting right here inside the tube is an operator. He's taking the pictures. <laughs> it's big enough for a man to sit in the entrance telescope. This telescope was state of the art in uh, 1950, and it's still one of the really high quality scopes. So this is all one of Newton's little contributions. After spectroscopy, Harvard Observatory was really dominant at that time, and to a large extent, it was a result of <laughs> They uh, uh, have any staff of women who are very effective at uh, studying and gathering information from the glass plates that are used for photography. The, this is the, the crew at the time. The uh, operator Pickering was a Harvard Observatory operator, and he learned that women would do the job better than men. It had men work, and he was so dissatisfied. The story says that one day he said, my housemate could do a better job in there. And he thought about it. He hired her, and she did a better job. <laughs> and she worked for a third of the pay. <laughs> it was so he, he's, he's operating an observatory. He's got to look at a budget. He was able to hire these women at a fraction of the worth, and he got double the use out of them. They were really dedicated. And it went on for a long time. Right. I've been bringing one woman here who is not one of those women. She was the stronger. Uh, for those who uh, were more, more dominant as technicians, many of them became very expert and, and made significant contributions, supplementing the, the astronomers who were, who were the, had the formal titles. But uh, she was born in England. Uh, took astronomy at Cambridge and couldn't get a degree because she's a woman. And that's a little irksome, you know. So she moved to the U.S., went to Radcliffe and got a degree. 
That's now Parth Harbor. Uh, then she worked as an astronomer and working toward an advanced degree. In 1925, she submitted a doctoral thesis and from the result of her studying the various data being recorded on the glass plates, she had concluded that the sun was primarily hydrogen and helium. This is usually spectroscopy kind of uh, procedures. Uh, one of her advisors was a very well-known astronomer, Henry Rizzo Norris. He disagreed with that. He insisted she take that out. That can't be. That's no good. Well, a little while, he changed his mind. So he published it as Stone Flanky. Oh, oh, it's quite hard. <laughs> but she didn't get rid of it, too. So we have a lot of, a lot of human uh, interference with things going on. Okay, now to kind of jump the scale. What do we have out there that we've been doing and get sort of out of the earth? Here are five uh, missions that have left, they are in the process of leaving the solar system. Two pioneers, two voyagers, and new horizons. First one's in 1972, the last one in 2006. Those being the launch dates on the bottom line here. So lots of details that uh, may be difficult for you to read and are only about so significant. The, ten, the pioneers were in pairs launched um, about three years apart. No, about a year apart. The two voyagers were just a couple of weeks apart, and New Horizons came on some years later. So this is showing a, a top view of the solar system and the various uh, missions went off in their various directions. You can also take a view from the side and see that they, relative to the plane of the solar system, it took different elevations. So they're out there, and some of them have left the solar system by now, and some are still in the process. I, this is really maybe me, one I shouldn't include, but I like the numbers part. So here where we have on the horizontal scale is the distance from the sun in astronomical units. Well, Jupiter's out about 5 AU, and Saturn's out about 9 AU. So, and then the vertical scale is velocity, how fast you have to be going relative to the sun in order to escape from the sun is the blue line. So if you're uh, just one AU out from the Earth, you get a, a 35 kilometers per second. But if you're out there at Saturn's range, you can get by with, you only need to have 10 kilometers per second. So um, what happened with, this is, uh, this is Voyager 2. Uh, when it was launched, and you see by the time we got out to the Jupiter orbit, it was well below the blue line. It got a gravity assist from Jupiter and kicked it up by more than double its speed. And it really picked up its speed. Well, then it slowed down, but still above the blue line, sent it by Saturn and got another kick or up higher. Uh, it's really amazing what they can do with the gravity assist from a big planet. And for Voyager 2, they use four planets to do it. And it's still on its way. So it will now forever, it's, uh, it may have escaped this solar system by now, I've lost track. So here are some of the pictures that those various missions uh, have taken. There are just hundreds of them out there, how to decide what to do. Well, one of my favorite missions is New Horizon. That was the one that was, uh, that its objective was to go and visit Pluto. In 1988, I went to a conference of several organizations, including IOTA, and the afternoon speaker on Saturday was Clyde Tomball. He was about 80-something at the time. He has been 55 years since he discovered Pluto, and the subject of the evening was why Pluto is a planet. He was anticipating the, the argument of people saying, oh, Pluto isn't the same, that it shouldn't be a planet. He was establishing going on record as saying, it is a planet, and here's what. Well, what else is expecting to say? The, the next speaker, a uh, friend I've known for many years, he calculates orbits of, of spacecraft. He gave a summary of the prospect of sending something to Pluto. 
and it was not good. But little time went by, and they, uh, we did finally get New Horizon launched. But meanwhile, many Pluto-like objects were discovered, and Pluto's status as a planet was seriously challenged. But now the, all these objects were what we call the Kuiper Belt. Kuiper Belt hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, I mean, in, in the 1980s, they just started to discover. But all kinds of things out there were happening. And so in August 2006, the International Astronomical Union officially reclassified Pluto as a dwarf. And uh, there's people still want to argue about that. But I think the fact of the matter is that they're arguing just to shoot off their mouths because Pluto is so different from the other eight planets and so much like the hundreds of thousands of other Kuiper Belt objects that really has to be in different categories. Uh, and one part of the controversy is that the, the conference in 2006 was some days it was in Prague. And the vote on uh, reclassifying Pluto came on the last day of the conference and about 90% of the attendees had left Albert. So it was not a good sampling that did the vote. Nevertheless, I'm sure they came up with the right answer. And I thought, well, now that if Hyde were still around, he'd agree, but probably not. And then a year or two later, Mike Brown was the astronomer at UCLA who was the head of the team I was finding most of these Kuiper Belt objects, and he put out a book. I bought a copy of it, and it's good reading, and he has good argument, but I think it's kind of insulting the way to put the, the title on. Everybody had to talk about it. Notice he's got an orbit in there for every planet, including Pluto, but he's taking care of Pluto. Right. <laughs> okay, over to Mike. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the overall Horizon Commission launched in 2006. It uh, got to uh, someplace, got to Pluto in 2015, nine years. It's a long way out there, Pluto. And we've got all the kinds of other stuff here we don't need to worry about. It's uh, used a uh, radio thermal uh, generator, which started with 200 watts of electrical power. And at, in 2032, they'll expect it to be down 150 watts. And that may be the thing that eventually limits the ability to communicate with. I mean, this is a long life thing. It's doing very well. This is a picture they got of Pluto as they went by here. Um, it had just been a blur on and I've seen before. So the new, new Horizons, primary thing, study uh, Pluto, they saw it, and they got a lot of other data too, of course. And there we can see some haze, which means atmosphere. Now that's critical. I was part of the thing that I even pushed to get launched when it did. Uh, the orbit of Pluto around the sun takes over 200 years. For about a quarter of that time, it's warm enough to have an atmosphere. Within a few years, Pluto is going to be in its part of orbit. It's so far from the sun that it'll all be condensed out. There'll be no atmosphere at sea. So that was, of course, it's when it's warmer, it's when it's closer to Earth and the sun is easier to get to also. Now, when they set out to go to Pluto, they had an additional objective. That was to visit something else, the something else to be determined later. So about three or four years after it was launched, the fellow got busy, he got access to the Hubble telescope, and he finally found something that is shown here as a discovery image. The, the two bright objects are stars he was tracking, and then you see that the five small things in circles, those are images of something at the time they called M69 uh, at 10 minute intervals. These, this consists of five exposure 10 minute intervals and should the fact that it, the shifted position uh, demonstrated it was a, a, another object. That was close enough to the alignment with Pluto that they could go and visit it. They had expected when they started out that it had a dozen candidates to choose from, but when push came to shove and went looking, they only found three 
and this is the best prospect. So set about to, to do something. Now, as he mentioned, I was participated for many years with Iowa, the International Occultation Timing Association. Here is results of occultation timing expedition looking at MU-69. MU-69 is out there 40 or more astronomical units, and it was going to pass in front of a star such that the shadow would fall across the southern part of Argentina. So the, the new, new Horizons people recruited a team to go down there and, and get an uh, do occultation. The left picture shows a number of lines and where each line represents timing, or you can translate that to distance. The shadow is moving across Argentina, and if you're in a fixed location, and you time when you see the shadow, or, or when you don't, the gap in the line here means that the star disappeared. It was blocked by the object, it was by the occulting object. So that's the data they got on the letter. Those uh, lines are separated by a couple of miles each. They covered, I don't know, 30 or so miles with uniformly spaced stations. And this shows what, two, four, six, seven, I think there were about 15 stations in total. These yellow ones that got data, they showed it. But notice that the gap, when you start to look on the right, you can superimpose a pair of spheres and say, well, that's one way to interpret the shape. That might be what happened. What they really after was to pin down the size of the object because that gives them an idea of the reflectivity, how, you know, how bright it was, didn't know how big it was. So they wanted to be able to set their cameras when they flew by it. That's good be accurate. <clears throat> so this did that very nicely. Now, when it came time to, to have that occultation, they put out a request to IOTA members <clears throat> to go and man the stations. Oh, boy, this is great. This is anything I've done all my life uh, for some years, and I'm pretty good at it. And that's, that sounded like a good idea. And then we got thinking, well, by then I was an octogenarian, and it's got Travel so more difficult, and turn out otters in July, which is winter in Argentina. So my delusions lasted about 10 or 20 seconds. And I did not volunteer, but other people did. And they found terrible weather. It was clear, it was windy. The Argentine government cooperated. They closed the highway for several hours. So they dispersed scopes and part. They provided big trucks. That was wind breaks for the individual telescopes. And so it was it was really a, a marvelous thing. The cost of doing that compared to sending something out to see it is just incredibly different. And so this was a, a, a very successful occupation. There's the picture show I think out in the few by. It looks like two spheres joined together. Exactly what they saw in Argentina. Okay, the Cassini mission was a famous one, very extensive, and the start it carried along a, what you call the Huygens, the Huygens probe. Huygens being a, a very famous name in astronomy, and, uh, and in fact, Huygens was the one who discovered Titan, the moon, the, the, the largest moon in the solar system. So it took seven years for Cassini to get out into the Saturn area. And first thing he did is made a trip by Titan and dropped off the Huygens probe. Probe had drifted for a few days and then went down and had a, a landing that went through uh, the atmosphere with parachute, parachute and it survived for a while and got a picture. So it's the only landing we have had of anything in the outer solar system. We've gotten things on the Mars and moon, but that's it. And here's one of the pictures they got. And on the, the, the atmosphere of methane kind of messes up the color. But that's what they found. But the, the then, okay, the logging probe was out of the way. That was early in 2004. That it, this chart on the right is a detailed rundown of what Cassini mission was doing for the next 13 years. Imagine this, it'd make one launch, get out in the neighborhood, and then they're able to cruise around and look at things for 13 years. 
So a little more detail at the top of the chart. You can see over on the left, the top line is the number of orbits. In that period, they made 294 orbits of Saturn. Um, and, and then if you look at the center line here, this is in 2005. You can see they made about a dozen passes of Saturn in that year. The next line down is flybys of Titan, the big moon. They made a couple of there in that first year. They made another six or eight in the next year and so on around. Then Enceladus is a moon of particular interest. They made a total of 23 flybys a bit in the 13 years. And then I see satellites, they made 15 passes those. Well, that was, here we're seeing the first couple of years. Then this is the next stretch of a few years. You see uh, lots of lots of orbits and little dash things, lots of Titan flybys of the uh, bright red dots, and um, by the ending. And when they were about to run out of propellant, they crashed into Saturn. They, they took, for the first time, they passed through the ring system. They'd been avoiding that because you never know the stray rock so much wacky and put you out of business. But when they're running out of talent, what they wanted to do was to uh, dispose of the spacecraft safely. The thing to do is to crash it into Saturn. And so they did that and made it close past the rings in the process. Uh, they had about, the, the figure they had was they had about 4% of the original propellant left, but they were not that confident how well they could measure. So they took that point and, and disposed of it. But, <laughs> 13 years is pretty good run. <laughs> and they saw lots of things along the way. This picture here I particularly like. The very fine line is the ring, edge on. And of course, you see one of the moons passing by. The black bands below the ring are the shadows of the rings. You get some interesting facts. I'm a little suspicious of the one on the left might be an artist's conception. It is awfully hard when you find this material to establish whether it's a real photo or whether it's a conception. That one I'm a little suspicious. I don't know. I try to keep the artist's conceptions after at least identify them. Here are a couple of the moons who went by, and the one on the left, of course, looks like a walnut. It's got this little ridge. Well, that's evidence of rotation. Generally, that's the explanation. Uh, the Earth bulges at the equator. Not with a fine ridge, it's a nice smooth thing, but uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter rotate much faster relative to the size than the Earth does, and they bulge a lot. The, the diameter uh, around the equator versus that over the poles is several percent different. For the Earth, it's, it's measurably different, but much smaller because it's rotating slower. And what with Hyperion there, what's going on? You can see a few collision craters, some things have hit it, but meanwhile, it's a strange, strange place. Enceladus is a moon of particular interest. It's big. It, there's evidence of lots of, of uh, water there, probably in the form of ice. And that uh, could explain some of the, the creases and cracks you see and so on. Is expansion and, uh, and fracturing. So with just to summary it again, Cassini made 294 orbits of Saturn. Went by Titan 127 times, <laughs> taking pictures and getting data all the time. Uh, and then this, this moon here, they went by it 23 times. So really tremendous amount of data they can track from some of these missions. We sent a number of rovers to Mars. And uh, you get the rover up there and crawl across the surface can do things you can't do if you're just flying by. And see here over the left, the little, little blue thing too small to read is Sojourner is the name of the first rover, and it lasted a few days or so. First attempt was successful, limited. Uh, then Spirit and Opportunity were launched at about the same time in 2004. One of them lasted about five years, the other about 15 years before they failed. Really tremendous success. I think I don't know just what their goals were, but to get any more in a couple of years out of one of those, you kind of feel like you're running luck, or else you're doing an awfully good job. Now, Curiosity was the next one. It's still active, still out there, 
And then it's only uh, a couple of years ago they launched Perseverance. And then the red bar is the Chinese Zhurong. That's another rover operating in different parts of Mars. So here's a self-portrait of Curiosity. They pretty much settled on a six-wheel design for the rovers. They've experimented things, and, and it has six wheels. It's got a, and as you see out in front, it's a probe. It can poke at rocks and, and move things around. With it. Obviously, the camera's up on top. This is uh, uh, the, the part of the delivery system for at least one of them is, a, is what I call a skyhook. Some jets to lower it down gently onto the surface so they don't bang things up. You can see the, the rover on the left. On the right, you see Ingenuity. That's the helicopter that's up there. And, and the real challenge, because the atmospheric density on Mars is the order of 1 or 2% what it is on Earth. You spin a blade and you don't have many molecules to give any depth. So they had quite a challenge in, in some of the laboratories here on Earth that developed that helicopter, spin it at extremely high speed in order to get it to work in a very, very minimal atmosphere. And I believe their, their objective on, the, on ingenuity was to get five successful flights just to do anything, just get it in the air, and I think figure flights of 10 seconds, 20 seconds, something was fine, but to do it five times, so far it's done it 50 times. And here is a view of the landscape from Perseverance, which includes ingenuity. And this is a dust devil that poses, that describes one of the problems that end up in various places. Mars has very little atmosphere, because that doesn't mean it can't have dust storms. And so this is seen from an orbiter. And there have been, um, one of the things that has limited the life of the rovers is their solar power. They have solar panels get a lot of dust on them, and they don't collect much sunlight. Well, there have been a number of instances when all of a sudden, power is restored. They got a boost, maybe a factor three or four times the power. Also, they figure somehow it's a dust devil happens to hit, lucky, and cleans the dust off. And then, of course, in, over the next months or something, dust accumulates again, because there's a lot of dust on Mars, and it's drifting around. So the, the first Mars rovers carried uh, laboratories so they can analyze the soil content. Perseverance is taking a different approach. It's collecting the samples and storing them to retrieve later. And that's kind of complicated, it turns out. They take core samples, uh, like the size of your finger, a piece of chalk, and the boring down preserves the layer structure. So that gives them more information than just the chemical content. And then they put in very carefully designed containers to preserve their condition. Then they drop them on the surface someplace and go and take another core. The object is to, is to collect about 40 samples, and they're like a half ounce a piece. So we're dealing here with, with uh, yeah, something like a pound of the samples. Then in 2008, in 2028, there'll be a retrieval mission. Send a rover up there, go run around the area and pick up those samples, Bundle them, put them into a package, launch them into orbit using a rocket they've carried along with a launch platform they've carried along. <laughs> they'll put in the object put in the orbit will be kind of like a basketball. And here's a drawing of what the, the rocket launch might be. Some platform on the surface of Mars shooting this rocket up. You gotta get it to pretty good uh, velocity to get it into orbit, but you can do that. So then the third step will be to send an Earth return orbiter up, something the size of an airplane, to go out in the orbit and grab that basketball and bring it back to Earth. So the plan is underway. It'll only take about 10 years or so to complete the cycle. Uh, the couple other sample return projects are uh, much ahead of that. Um, Ryugu is a good sized asteroid. Uh, was visited in 2018 by the Hayabushi 2 mission. That's a Japanese operation. They got a sample in 2019, and another few months later, after they fired a slug into the asteroid to stir up the soil, give them some new to see. Well, they collected samples, departed in November 2019, 
and they dropped the samples in South Australia just two months ago. So you can see the the uh, uh, streak of the reentry of this capsule coming down. They had a kind of target area about 10 miles square in South Australia where it's supposed to land, and within a few hours they were able to find it. <laughs> and they think that they have about one gram of soil from Ryugu in there, <laughs> the south of Japan. <laughs> then Bennu, another asteroid, was visited in 2018 by a different mission, which hung around, mapped the asteroid, and in 2020, they did a touchdown and a sample extraction. In 2021, it left and is due to get back to Earth in a few months. So this business of collecting something remotely is challenging and end up with pretty small samples. By contrast, you can send a man to the moon and they can bring back hundreds of pounds. Uh, it comes at considerable cost. <laughs> uh, the, there are six landings and to my way of thinking, the primary reason for sending men to the moon was so you could claim you'd done it first as public relations, and it did that. And you have, they left some things behind which made it easier to measure and move and so on. They got some spin-off technology and computer science, solid state technology and so on, and returned 843 pounds of, of soil and water. Now, those, are, those samples probably really the, the real value of going to the moon that way. And the Johnson Space Center still has about three quarters of that material. They distribute about 400 samples per year, a gram here, two grams there. <laughs> and many of those are with the condition they will be returned. Somebody's examining it, doing what or not, then they'll send it back to Johnson Space Center. So they're really exerting a considerable effort to uh, uh, control that sample. Now, there were six Apollo missions that landed. You see the numbers in the upper right. There were, they had uh, the rockets, the, the uh, mechanics, the hardware for uh, missions up through number 20, but a couple of those got canceled fairly early, primarily because the public was losing interest. A man would go to the moon and he'd come back and make the front pages for a day or two, and that was pretty expensive publicity for NASA, so they were canceling. When they got around to Apollo 18, was far enough along, they had the crew, so the three million dollar men in the world had been in training as a group, and one of them was a geologist, I forget his name now, but the geology community made a major campaigning, and yet he moved up to number 17. So. Well, now we can say that one geologist has been to the moon and that, that uh, number 17 collected more weight in rock than any the others and it was under supervision of trained geologists. So that was kind of a, a nice way to end it anyway. And orders of magnitude, more material gained that way than any other. I mentioned this test, this is the current one, that our dual asteroid redirection test. Okay, they found uh, 20 years ago or so, discovered this dual asteroid, Dimorphos, orbiting around Didymos, and here are relative scale kind of things. I, th I found this one chart, and I didn't like their samples very well. How do you compare a long, skinny thing like the Eiffel Tower with a big solid rock? So I found, I, I found that the <clears throat> Devil's Tower in Wyoming is kind of in the size range between the two. Uh, elements of the uh, double asteroid. So I'll put that on comparison. That's many of you seen Devil's Power, I'm sure. So the point is that uh, here is a scale of Amorphos on the left and Dimorphos on the right. That's approximately to scale their sizes and their separations. And then that threw Devil's Tower in there just for fun. See, they're only a thousand meters apart, 3,000 feet, a little over half a mile apart and Dimorphos is rotating around Didymos. Then the interesting thing, the unfortunate part is, well, actually, the reason they know that there are two there is because Dimorphos have passed in front of Didymos, and we can see 
that the little trot and the light level, instead of seeing reflection light from both of them, they're seeing just from one. Then continue on a few hours past the backside, the light level will drop again because one of them is out of sight. So for years, never saw it any morphos, but knew it was there. The, the morphos, that is. So it's orbiting. And the orbital period was about 11 hours and 55 minutes, about 12 hours to go around. Now here's a diagram showing the two. And the object of dart was to go in and hit uh, a dimorphos head on. Um, uh, the dart was, I try to find a size comparison. It's like a very heavy Harley motorcycle in terms of weight. It's like a refrigerator in size, but it's uh, 1,150 pounds, something like that. But traveling at something like 15,000 miles per hour. So a whammo, a really smacked it. And they did the timing so that they're right as close to square on as they can. And, and then uh, they hit it. It's, it's really fun to see what goes down. So before the collision, it took 11 hours, 55 minutes. They expected a new period to be about five minutes shorter. They figured it would be success if they shortened the orbit by 70, 30 seconds, a minute and a half. Uh, but they were hoping for five minutes. And then after the impact, they could monitor from Mars and see what the orbital time was and tell how successful they'd been. And then also the Hubble and the Jane Trebb were able to look at it and see what's going on. And the result was they reduced the time by 33 minutes, far, far beyond what they expected possible. In my opinion, they found the whole thing was a rubble pile and they kicked so much stuff loose. And it's, of course, it's the reaction when they kicked the debris loose, it's like firing a, a rocket the other direction, slowing it down. And so this is now a series of images showing the live, some of you were present, this happened last September, and live we watched in a legacy theater at both the theater. So here are a bunch of snaps in the last minute. And this, this last, there, there's the last one. The, the bigger rocks here, this rock, I tried to scale from various things, I think did a pretty good job. They're like 15 or 20 feet across. So that is a rubble pile. That's not a big solid rock. You can tell that for sure. And so it hit right in here someplace. Um, but then a few days before the collision, they had dropped off a camera and pulled some sort of trick. So it came along three minutes afterwards. So here's a picture from that camera. On the, on the right here, we have dimorphos. Now it looks like a mess. They can't make any detail at all because there's dirt everywhere. And this is the parent asteroid, Latidimos. And uh, so that, and it got a lot more detail in that. But, and this is a picture from the Hubble of the solar wind blowing the debris away. I mean, it's covered millions of miles. They really, really made a mess. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so the follow on is the Hera mission. And it's going to go and visit the two asteroids. And it'll have cameras and spectrometer and two CubeSats. These little CubeSats are getting out in the area. And remember, these things are only half a mile apart. And these two CubeSats are being able to cruise around there and get all kinds of detailed information. So do launch in October next year. And it'll take about 10 months to get there. They'll be on station for about six months. At the end of the six months, if all goes well, they'll be able to get one of the CubeSats each to park on each of the two asteroids and discuss it and uh, yeah, let's see. Mo I guess monitor them seismically and ensure whatever way it happens. But that's something to look forward to in the near future, only a couple of years away. And now to conclude this, I'm going to <clears throat> let you read this page and then we'll go on to have the three minute video.
That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.